Okay, like Chuki said, I am Christine Kennedy. I work at Home Advisor as an Android developer. About a year and a half ago, the development team decided to switch from Java to Kotlin, and I fell in love with it. And ever since, I've been telling everybody what a great language it is and how they really should learn it. So, out of curiosity, has anybody here used Kotlin, or do you use it in your jobs right now? Okay, and everybody else never touched it before. All right, cool. So this will be an introduction to get you familiar with the basic syntax and idioms of the language. So like Chuki said, if you see it in example slides of conferences, then you'll kind of figure out what's going on. And then hopefully you will be inspired to learn it yourself and make the switch too. Um, so I'm gonna be covering a lot of topics fairly quickly. If anybody has any questions, just shout them out. You don't have to wait until the end. So first, why Colin? If you already know Java, why do you need to learn a whole new language? Well, Kotlin was specifically created to improve upon Java and take away some of the pain points. And it was also designed to be 100% interoperable with it. So that means that in your project, you can call Java code from Kotlin or you can call Kotlin code from Java. That makes it really simple to switch your project over in kind of an organic, gradual fashion. So at Home Advisor, all of our new development is done in Kotlin, but we still have a lot of legacy code in Java. And it's pretty seamless to have them in the same project. Um, also, Kotlin looks a lot like Java. It's pretty familiar, but it's a lot shorter and more concise and cleaner, which is very nice. It does away with a lot of the boilerplate code from Java. And on average, they say that Kotlin code is actually has 40% fewer lines than Java does, which is a really huge difference. And that makes it more fun to write because you can get to the point and you don't have to worry about writing a lot of overhead. And it also makes it a lot easier to read and understand because you can see exactly what it's doing. And a lot of the shortcuts are very intuitive and easy to understand. Kotlin is also more robust than Java. And not just because fewer lines of code means that you have fewer opportunities for bugs, although that is also a factor. But Kotlin enforces null safety in a way that it actually almost eliminates null pointer exceptions, which you know you get a lot of in Java. Um, it also encourages immutability, which is good for thread safety and just the general stability of your code. So if you switch your project to Kotlin, you'll probably find that you start getting a lot fewer crashes. Finally, you should use Kotlin because Google uses Kotlin now. At Google I.O. this year, they announced that Kotlin is now the preferred language for Android development. And we're turning the corner. Just over 50% of Android developers are now using Kotlin. And that number is definitely growing. There was a uh, Stack Overflow survey that said Kotlin is the fourth most loved language and the fifth most wanted. And it definitely beat Java in both of those categories. So if you are looking to go into Android development or you're already there, Kotlin kind of used to be the optional language, but it's slowly becoming less optional and kind of the new standard. So it is definitely time to learn it. And it's not that hard and it's really fun. So we will start with the basics of what Kotlin looks like. With variable types in Kotlin, all variable types are objects. There are no primitives like there are in Java. So you still have your ints and longs and booleans, but they are objects. Kotlin also uses type inference like Python does. So you don't need to say what type your variable is. You can just give it a value, and Kotlin will figure it out itself. So you would just need the keyword. If you have the keyword var here, then you just need the variable name and give it the value. And Kotlin will infer double quotes, this is a string. If you want to explicitly say what your variable type will be, then you put it after the variable name, colon, and then the type, and then you can give it a value. Once your variable has a type, you can't change it, it's set. So if we define altitude as 5280, Kotlin will infer that that's an int, and you would get an error if the, you then try to assign a string to it. So string type in Kotlin is very cool because you can use string templates to create them. You don't have to use a string builder. That means that you can put your variables right into the string in place with just a dollar sign in front of regular variable names. Or if you have an expression that you want to evaluate, then you would put it in curly braces after the dollar sign. Also like Python. Curiosity, does anybody here write Python? OK, cool. <laughs> So mutability, like I said, Kotlin encourages you to use immutable variables whenever you can. If you do want to have a mutable variable, then you would use the var keyword, and then you can change the value. 
If you want to have an immutable variable, then you use val and you cannot change it after that. So it's essentially like using the final keyword in Java, except just a little tidier. Uh, collections are also immutable by default. So if you create a list with the list of operator here, that will be an immutable list of four values that you cannot add to or remove from. If you want a list that you can change the contents of, then you have to explicitly say that you want a mutable list. So just a note, it may look strange that you have a mutable list in a val, but val just means that you can't assign a new object to the variable. You can still make changes to the object that you do have there. So collections in Kotlin are very easy and intuitive. Like we saw, you can define a list or a mutable list just with mutable list of. You can give it all the values that you want to instantiate your list with at first. So it's nice to get that all on one line. Um, you have add functions, remove functions, and all of the elements are square bracket indexed. Array looks pretty much exactly the same. Um, map also looks very close. You can instantiate your map with pairs of key to value, a list of those, and you would also use square bracket indices to either read values or add more to the map. So a very cool part of Kotlin that I love are the collection methods. You can do a lot of powerful functionality in a very small amount of code. So we're going to look at a user list, which is a list of user objects. Um, again, just to note, you don't actually have to put this. Um, if you just assign user list from get all users, then it will infer from the return type, but I'm just being extra illustrative here. So if you have a group of users and you want to find one particular user by ID, in Java, you would do a for loop, iterate through each user in the list and check each ID. In Kotlin, all you have to do is use this find function and it takes a lambda here. We'll talk a little more about lambdas later if you haven't heard of them, but you just say which parameter of the object that you want to, um, that you want to do the equality check on, and it will return one value. So it's also not a case where you get a whole list back and you say, is my list empty? Is there only one in there? It's going to return the first one, and that's it. Um, if you do want to get a sublist of all matching objects, then you can use filter. In this case, we want local, filter, or local users, then we could filter on state equals. Uh, map will get you a sublist of one particular parameter. So if we wanted to find all the IDs of all the users in the list, then we could just use map and get our sublist easily that way. And group by will make a map out of a list. Um, if you define a parameter, say that there are five distinct types of user, if you group by that, then you will have a new map where all the different types are the keys and then the values would be the list of matching users. And there's a lot more. In fact, I had like twice the number, but I thought that I should cut it down. The point is there's a lot of great methods that let you do a lot with a little. So nullability is one of Kotlin's most important features. All objects are non-nullable by default. So if you are going to declare a string, you must give it a value right away so it's never in a null state. If you try to declare an object without giving it a value, then you will get an error. There's a couple ways around that. If you want to have a variable of a nullable type, then you have to put a question mark after it, and then you can assign null to it. You can also use late in it, which is like a promise to the compiler saying, I'm declaring this value. It's a non-nullable type and I'm not giving it a value yet, but I promise I'm gonna give it a value before I use it. So you should be careful with that because clearly if you use it and you made a mistake and you haven't given it a value, then it's gonna throw an exception and you're probably gonna get a crash. But if you think about it, that's pretty much just how Java works by default. So one of the most common ways that late init is used is if you are declaring your views as class member variables in an activity, they're not gonna have a value until on view created is called. So it's generally safe that you can declare those with late init and then assign the values there. So for null safety, if you do have a nullable variable, then you have to tell Kotlin how you wanna handle it if it is null. So one way is to use the null safe operator, which is the question mark after the object. And this says, if my cat is not null, then call meow. And if it is null, 
then skip the line and just move on. That's generally the best way to handle nulls. You can also use what's called the double bang operator. That says that if my cat is null, then throw an exception. Bad idea, unless you are explicitly wanting to throw the exception and catching it. But there's not usually a lot of good reasons to use the double bang. It's best practice to use the question mark because that's what makes your code safe and not going to crash. So sometimes you don't just want to skip to the next line if you have a null. You want to um, you want to declare some alternate or backup behavior, and that's when you use the Elvis operator. So you may have heard of the Elvis operator before. It's the question mark with the colon. It's supposed to look like Elvis with the little hair swoosh. So I know it's hard to see. <laughs> So basically, the Elvis operator is in if not null, do this, else do that. So in this case, we want to assign a value to name. We're saying if my cat is not null, then use its name, else use an empty string instead. You can also use it for calling functions, not just assigning values. In this case, if my cat is not null, then meow. But if it is null, then print line couldn't meow. So. You can use that to hopefully cover all the bases that you need for if nulls happen. Uh, control flow looks very similar as it does in Java. Um, one thing that's kind of nice is the ternary operator. You don't have to use question marks and colons anymore. You can use if and else. So that makes a very readable ternary. Um, for loops look a lot the same. You have your for value in list. But one of the cool things is that you have a lot more ways to define how you're going to loop. Um, I really love the until. If you say zero until my list dot size, that's going to do it from zero to size minus one, which is nice because you don't like to write the minus one every time. Um, you can also have a decrementing loop with down to. You can define your own range with min dot dot max. Um, you can define a step if you want to go by twos or tens or whatever. We also have a dot or a with index function that will give you both the index and the value as you iterate through the loop. So that can be handy if you want to keep track of both. And it's also very easy to iterate through a map. You just say for key and value, and that will iterate through all the pairs for you. Yes. I think that you would put the step after the down to. So the when is like the switch statement on steroids. Switch is a little bit limited in that you can only use a primitive or a string as the argument, and you can only use equality as the terms to match it. In Kotlin, you can use any kind of object as your parameter, and you can use any kind of expression to evaluate your match, and you can also use it to assign values. So in this case, we have an attack role. We want to see what our outcome is going to be. So we can check if our object here is one certain value, if it's in a range, if it's of a certain type. This is really good for smart casting. So if you have an object like an exception that you don't know what kind it is, but you want to take different actions on it based on what it is, then it's just really easy to say, if client exception, do this. If server exception, do that. Except not if, when. Um, we also have else, which is the default case. You don't always need to have this, but since we're using the when to assign a value, then we need our options to be exhaustive. And also, you don't even need an object at all to use when. If you keep it blank, then you can just put any expression that you want in here to evaluate and then take action. So this is good if you have a lot of if else's and kind of a complicated tree, then you can consolidate it into one when and have it hopefully a bit more readable. Cat break. I thought my slides were kind of dry. Chuki was kind enough to give me some pictures of her cats. We have Tyrion and Arya, and they're very adorable. <laughs> All right, on to the dry stuff. <laughs> Classes look fairly similar as they do in Java, but there are some significant differences. Um, first, I have this open keyword because all classes in Kotlin are final by default. So if you ever want to extend your class or mock it in a unit test, then you have to explicitly say that it's open. Then we have the class keyword and the class name. And then we have these parameters here, which is actually the constructor. 
In Kotlin, you can define multiple constructors and you can declare one of them as the primary constructor, which is essentially just putting um, variables in here that will be assigned to your class as member variables. Now there's no body for the primary constructor, but what you can use instead is this init block. The init is going to be executed first thing when the class is instantiated, right after these member variables are instantiated too. So if you have a val of a non-nullable type, you don't even have to give it a value at that point. As long as you assign a value in the init, then the compiler knows that you're good. So if you want to define other constructors, you do it with the constructor keyword here. You can also give it parameters. And then after the colon, you call this to call the primary constructor with whatever parameters that takes. And any secondary constructors, their contents will be executed after all of the init blocks. You can have multiple init blocks that will execute sequentially. So back up to the top, we have parent, which is a superclass, and then iBook, which is an interface. There's no extends or implements keyword. Whether it's a class or an interface, you just put it in a comma-separated list after this colon. Um, and if you have a superclass, then any, um, any parameters that the constructor takes, you would put there. If it doesn't take any parameters, then you would just have empty parentheses. So the way that you instantiate an object is there is no new keyword. You just give it the name of the class and then in parentheses, any constructor parameters that it takes. Data classes are one of my favorite parts of Kotlin. Um, data classes are essentially POJOs. They're a class that are meant to hold data and that's about it. So in Java, you would have your long list of variables and then you would have an even longer list of getters and setters. Kotlin does all the getting and setting for you. So you never have to maintain a list, which is so nice. Um, basically, all you have to do is put a list of all the member variables that you want in what's essentially the primary constructor. Make sure that you use the data keyword and then you get some freebies out of this. Not only do you get all your getters and setters, the equals function will be overwritten to check the equality of all the variables, which is usually something that you would have to override yourself. Um, it overrides hash code in the same way. It will override to string so that you get a nice string that prints out the values of all the variables in the class. And you don't just get the name of the class and the hash code, which tells you nothing. So you also get a copy function, which we can see in the example. If we instantiate our data class, you do have to give it all the values up front. You can't call it with empty parentheses and decide what your values are, are later. It comes all at once. Then you can use the copy function to make a new copy of that object where all the values are the same, except for whatever parameter you say that you want to be different. So this would give us a new book called The Grapes of Wrath, but it's also by John Steinbeck, also has zero pages read. Yes? How do you limit access with a setter? Um, you can do a custom setter. I've actually never tried to limit access before, but I'm not sure, but you may be able to override the setter to limit it however you want. Um, so, whoops, sorry. Um, when we are referencing the variables inside the class, then you just refer to the name directly to read it or to assign a new value to it. And that includes even if you have a Java class that has a private variable with a public getter, if you're calling it in your Kotlin code, then you are still going to refer to it directly by name because Kotlin takes care of that for you. And you can use the get function if you want, it's not gonna break, but Android Studio is gonna say, you should use the property access syntax instead. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, see the uh, name and author of vowels and where this bar is that is the only one that gets the setter? You're right. Yes, it is. So, yeah, I think, okay. I think that my code still compiles, but yes, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, because you're doing copies. Yes. Yep. So you need to find those variables What's that? Sorry. You need to find those variables in the constructor. You mean like with default arguments? What do you mean by define? Yeah, file name being a string instead of probably being a constructor. 
Yeah, it's because the data class is just essentially one big constructor, which is probably why that you need to give all your values up front. This is really good for JSON API calls that you would just, the result would go directly into the data class. So Kotlin does not have static keyword. If you want to have a static variable or method, then you have to use what's called a companion object. Um, you just declare a companion object inside your class, anything in here, you will be able to refer to as if it were static by giving the class name and then referring to it directly. There's a little snag that if this works in Kotlin, if you are calling this code from Java, then it would be converter.companion.convert because to Java, this is just a static inner class. So if you want to get around that and you want to be able to refer to it directly in both Kotlin and Java, then you can use these annotations of JVM field or JVM static. And then in Java, you can just say converter.convert. So for functions, we've seen a few of these already, but an explicit look at the declaration. First, you have your visibility modifier. If you omit this, then your function will be public by default. And then fun is the keyword to declare a function. And you have your variable name, your parameters. You don't put val or var in front of these, just the variable name. And you do have to put the type name. You can't use type or inf inference. It has to know what's going to come. And then colon at the end, and then the return type, followed by the body. If your function does not return anything, then you don't have to declare it void. You would just omit the return type altogether. And also, you can use default arguments to overload your function, which also cleans up a lot of code reuse. So in this case, we have two string parameters that each have their default value. So if we call this function with no parameters, then we're going to get the defaults of hello friend. If you only provide one string, you have two string defaults. So what it's going to do is it's going to match the first one and then use the default on the second one. So that will get you hello, Joe. But it's not really nice to just put in one string when you have two. That's not very readable. So the best practice there would be to use a named argument where you say the name of the variable that you're giving the value to, and that makes it more clear. And you also don't have, or named arguments are not just for default arguments. You can use them for any function. If you have a function that takes six Booleans, and it just says true, true, false, true, false, and you're never going to remember what all those are, then it's nice to use a named argument so you can say this is true and this is false. It makes it a lot more readable. Yeah. Yeah, they're available now. Uh, extension functions are pretty cool. They let you extend a class with your own functionality. So in this case, I want to add a function to the string class. I think it ought to have a function where we capitalize all the E's in a string for some reason. So this function declaration looks a lot like a normal function declaration, except that we have the class that we want to add it to dot function name. Um, also, I just wanted to show that you don't always have to use the curly braces to define a function. If it's a one-liner, then you can treat the function as a value to be assigned. So in this case, the function of string dot capitalize E equals no, the, sorry, on the right side, the start replace. So that's just a nice, clean way to do your simple one-liner functions. Once we declare that, if we have a string, then we can call that function on the string like it was part of the class the whole time. Yes. Um, it's only going to be in the scope of where you define it. So Lambda functions, just out of curiosity, how many people are familiar with Lambdas? Okay, good. So most people, but um, for those who are not, basically a Lambda is an anonymous function. And like in the case of setting an on-click listener, in old Java, you used to have to instantiate a whole on-click listener class override the function, and then finally get to the point of what you want to do when the button is clicked. With a lambda, you just give it the function as a value. Um, the, para darn it. the parameter you name here with an arrow, and then 
the what you want to do with the parameter. In Kotlin, uh, we can get it down super small. If there is only one parameter, then we refer to it as it because we know what it's going to be. There's no need to name it. Um, if the only parameter in the function of onclick listener is a function, then you can remove the parentheses. And basically all you're left with is the button, set the listener, curly braces. This is what I want to do with it. Yes. So just to make sure, it's now also, it turned into a keyword now. Yes, it is a keyword. Okay. Yeah. So then we get to scope functions, which use Lambda. I think scope functions are probably the most foreign looking part of Kotlin that you may be going through the code saying, oh yeah, this all looks familiar. Then you get to some of these and say, I don't know what's going on anymore. So I wanna spend a little time talking about these. Basically scope functions are just functions that you execute on an object to create a temporary scope that is in the context of that object. Um, there are five different functions and slightly different ways that they go about doing pretty much the same thing. Some of them inside the body of the temporary scope, the object will be this, so you can refer to its member variables and functions directly. In some of them, the object will be it, so it will be like the lambda arguments that we've already seen. In some of them, at the end of the block, it will return the context object itself, and in some of them, it will return the lambda result, which is just the last statement of the block. So with the slight variations, we use these in slightly different ways. Probably the most common one that you're going to see is let. This is very often used to perform null checks on an object. And if the object is not null, then you have a whole block in which you know that the object is not null, so you don't have to keep treating it in a null safe way over and over. So in this case, we have name, which is of a nullable string. We are calling let on the null safe version of name. So since this is one where the context object is it, it is now going to be a non-nullable copy of name that we don't have to use a question mark or double bang or anything inside this block of code. So you will often see let just kind of to avoid doing all that null safety. Um, you can also use let to make assignments. In this case, I'm renaming it because sometimes you just want to do that for readability and all you do is decide what you want to call it, put your arrow and then it is referred to by that name. So we're going to do um, some execution and then the last line is going to be returned and assigned to new name. So you don't have to put a return value, you just put the expression itself and that will be returned. Yes? So what happens when name is null? Uh, when name? Did I not write that well? Um, it may just assign null to new name because it could infer it as a null variable. So oh, it's a good thing to check. Um, probably you would end up doing an Elvis operator after that and giving it your backup would be the best way to go about doing it. Apply is kind of the opposite of let in that in this one, the context object is this and it will return the object at the end. So this is really good if you are instantiating objects and setting their properties, you can do it with a minimum of code this way. So you instantiate your book and then call apply on this new book object. Because it is this, you can refer to the parameters directly and just set all of their values. And at the end, the object with all of its new value set will be returned and assigned to this new value. So yeah, if you're ever instantiating an object, then you should probably be using apply to set its parameters. Also, um, let and apply are probably the ones that you're gonna see the most often. Also is one for if you want to kind of do some side effects, afterthoughts on an object. This is mostly for, um, I think, more functional based programming where you have a lot of functions that stream together and you want to take some actions in the middle. So in this case, we're gonna call get user. That's going to get us a user object. Then with that, we can call dot also and say, by the way, 
we got this user make a logging statement. Then with the same object, it because it's returning the context object, then with the same object, we can call authenticate and that could change the auth state value in there. So when we call also again, then we can now do a logging statement on the new state of the object. Run is good for if you need to use a class, but you only need it for one particular result and you don't care about keeping the class around afterwards. So in this case, we are going to uh, instantiate a calculator and call dot run on it. This is one where the context object is this. So we can refer to the operands and set them directly. We'll set the operands to a list of numbers, set the operator to whatever your operator is, and then call the method calculate. And since this returns the Lambda result, whatever comes out of the calculate function will then be assigned to result. Your code moves on and you don't have a calculator that you don't care about anymore hanging around. Out. Okay. <laughs> so um, all of those other uh, functions were more like extension functions that you would call on your object. You can also call run and with as independent functions. Um, run is pretty handy. Basically, it, darn it, I have to stop clicking. Um, if you want to call a method on an object, but you don't know which object you want to call it on, then you can use run to do some logic, return an object. In this case, we have a couple views and we want to see if the user is logged in or not to see which view that we want to show. So this run block will return the view to then have the show method call on it. Um, with is like apply where you pass in an object and then everything inside is going to be um, in the context of that object as this. So if you have one object that you want to perform a lot of methods on, then you can just put them in a with block and say, let's start the ignition, turn on the radio, do all the other stuff with the car. All right, we got through that quicker than I wanted to or quicker than I'd anticipated rather. So I will, I had a slide on coroutines that I wasn't gonna talk about because I didn't think there would be enough time. Coroutines are not basic. They're not really intro to Kotlin, but they're super cool. And they are probably a reason to learn Kotlin. Basically they will let you run asynchronous code in a synchronous fashion without blocking the UI thread. So you could just say authenticate user and then print result was the user authenticated or not? And it will get its own thread, do its thing, come back onto the main thread, and then continue on seamlessly. People are saying that it's going to take over Rx Java. It seems like we're always looking for a new way to do asynchronous code because we're never happy with how it works. And I think that this could be the one that actually does it. So once you get past your intro to Kotlin, you should look into coroutines. Now, Hopefully you are feeling a bit more familiar with Kotlin syntax. Hopefully it looks familiar and you think that you can figure the code samples out when you see them. So the next step would be to start writing the code yourself. I would recommend going into Android Studio, taking a project that you already have in Java and just choosing one file to convert from Java to Kotlin. Android Studio will do it for you. It does a pretty good job. It gets you like 95% of the way there. There may be a few errors that you need to fix. There will be a lot of double bangs because it doesn't know what you want to do with your null. So you should go back and say what you want to do or refactor so that you don't have nullable variables. You can make everything non-nullable. But that's a real easy way to kind of slide easily into Colin. And as for documentation resources, you don't need to do anything more than the official Kotlin website. It has fantastic documentation great resources, anything that you're looking for, you'll find it there. They also have an online playground where you can just kind of mess around and see what Kotlin does. Um, scope functions, I just found this to be a very useful link if you're still having trouble telling them apart or you don't know when you should use which one, this has some nice visual aids. And if you're the kind of person who likes a textbook, then Kotlin in Action is a great book and I would recommend that one. So, any questions? Is 
Um, I think that they were pretty careful to make Kotlin perform as well as Java does. And I haven't noticed any differences in my project. Oh, because yeah. They're technically going to the same virtual machine and the bytecode will be ultimately JVM bytecode. Yes, very good point. They're both JVM languages. Yeah. Yeah. Which should be yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. So uh, it, seems, uh, it seems like sometime when you're cleaning things. Like, okay, let's like chains like this one. Or usually if you're doing computation, you want to do filter where you do the other chapters. Mm. You don't want to um, you know concatenate onto something when you're doing value. Yeah. Um so, so do you usually filter for it? How, how would you know if you've done it? If you want to it? <laughs> would you notice the slowdown? Unless you're dealing with a lot of data, I don't think you would notice the slowdown. If you want to make sure you're doing it in the most efficient way, I would probably just go through each step and kind of say what's going in and what's coming out and see whatever you need to get it the smallest. Do that first. And yeah, then just maybe see like, well, what would happen if I did this one first? I think it's probably more in art than a science. You could just kind of see what your needs are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, seems like also and width were quite similar. Is the chain fractions is there? Let's look at the. Oh, uh, look at the cheat sheet. Um, also is going to. Let's see. They both return the context object itself. It's just whether you use this or it. I'd say at that point it's personal preference. If it's more efficient to have it as this, then, then I would use this. Because these are all very similar. It's just slight modifications. So you can get exactly the one that you want. All right. Is JDI also still as ugly as it will be as I expect it will be? Sorry, is what? Uh, finding the JNI code. Uh, I haven't done that, so I can't tell you. But if it's ugly, then I'd probably say, yeah, it's still ugly. <laughs> With no information, it's ugly. <laughs> Where can we find your slides? They are in the description of this event. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank all right, well, you. yeah, thank you all for, for coming. <laughs> <laughs>